but of this the opponent knoweth not. Here the face as a living whole is distinct from analysis of its separate parts and physiognomical value. As with Alston's portrait, there is a difference between the face in repose and the face animated by expression. Coleridge also sets up a, a distinction between what he has been told about the physiognomical properties of his face and his own self-knowledge. His casting of the self in the third rather than the first person further undermines a sense of secure self-understanding. Thus the self is presented as unknowable, even to its possessor who is other to his own self. As Denise de Gua argues, the fragmentary nature of Coleridge's self-portrait of practices indicates how absence is always encoded within the portrait. Quote, the painter does not aim at copying or producing resemblance, but at rendering an expression that should shine through the portrait and that Coleridge calls the ideal sense of the person. It is this ideal sense of the person that representations of the face seek to express. However, the face's elusivity points to its status as a source of the sublime, which may also reveal the elusivity of the self as an ultimately unstable entity, only visible in glimpses. I want now to turn to a written account to capture the absent presence of Coleridge's face and through it the elusive self. William Hazlitt's description of his initial meeting with Coleridge in his essay, My First Acquaintance with Poets. Hazlitt describes Coleridge's facial features and I will read this passage in full to show the level of detail into which Hazlitt delves. His appearance was different from what I had anticipated from seeing him before. At a distance, and in the dim light of the chapel, there was to me a strange wildness in his aspect, a dusky obscurity, and I thought him pitted with smallpox. His complex and complexion was at that time clear and even bright, quote, as are the children of yon azure sheen. His forehead was broad and high, light as if built of ivory, with large projecting eyebrows, and his eyes rolling beneath them like a sea with darkened luster, quote, a, a certain tender bloom his face or spread, a purple tinge as we see it in the pale thoughtful complexions of the Spanish portrait painters, Murillo and Velasquez. His mouth was gross, voluptuous, open, eloquent. His chin good humored and round, but his nose, the rudder of the face, the index of the will was small, feeble, nothing, like what he has done. It might seem that the genius of his face as from a height surveyed and projected him with sufficient capacity and huge aspiration into the world unknown of thought and imagination with nothing to support or guide his veering purpose. As if Columbus had launched his adventurous course for the new world in a scallop without oars or compass. So at least I comment on it after the event. There are many things of interest in this passage, but what stands out from Hazlitt's account as a whole is the sheer amount of detail the minute descriptions of Coleridge's features display clearly the emphasis on particularity over universality. Coleridge's face is not represented as universal, a universal or common face, but as uniquely his, exhibiting individuality. At the beginning of the passage, Hazlitt reinforces the distinction between his prior expectations and the actuality of Coleridge's presence and appearance. Yet even in this in-person encounter, which might seem to provide immediacy and clear vision, the gaze is still mediated through other factors, producing a particular representation of Coleridge, which might obscure the true self. Hazlitt points out that he is seeing Coleridge at a distance and in the dim light of the chapel. The distance between self and other and the lighting of the space thus shape the experience of seeing, similar to how the viewing conditions of the portrait govern its reception. These mediating factors, which mitigate the directness of the encounter, lead to Coleridge's dusky obscurity. Even in this face-to-face -face interaction, the face eludes clear sight and is sublime in its obscurity. Although this is a personal description of Coleridge, rooted in Hazlitt's memory of him, he includes two quotations from other sources in his attempt to characterize Coleridge. This creates a pastiche of description exposing the inadequacy even of Hazlitt's own words and memory to encapsulate the experience of seeing the face and painting uh, of painting a verbal portrait of the other. 
as with Coleridge's fragmentary depictions of self and absent presence, Hazlitt's use of quotations and allusions points to an ephemeral presence and an experience and encode within itself absence, even at the moment of encounter. The sublimity of the face and the other translates into an inability to represent them through words, exposing the limitations of language. This is also evident in Hazlitt's comparison of Coleridge's face to the pale, thoughtful complexions of the Spanish portrait painters, Murillo and Velasquez, who I have a portrait of um, painted by both of these artists here. Here, the actual living face is compared to these painted faces, implying that Coleridge's face too is a representation of something further than itself. At the end of the passage, Hazlitt likens the capacity of Coleridge's face to Columbus. Again, Hazlitt can only describe Coleridge's face through reference to something beyond and external to it. The simile comparing Coleridge's face to this quest for the new world also broaches the unknown, connecting Coleridge's face with obscurity. Hazlitt also undermines his own account by capping it with a qualification. So at least I comment on it after the event. This statement seems to suggest that Hazlitt acknowledges the deficiencies of his own verbal rendering, recognizing as well that it is inevitably limited by the separation of time and space. His description is written after the event, and so it is mediated through Hazlitt's own memory and biases. The writer's selfhood and individual perspective impose on the subject's individuality, fashioning the subject into a blend of self and other, rather than a complete objective entity. Lastly, this passage highlights the face's power, despite its obscurity, as illuminating, or at least pointing towards, character. This is displayed in Hazlitt's connection of a small and particular feature, the nose, to the index of the will. Coleridge's small, feeble nose reflects his lack of action. Yet this also reflects Hazlitt's personal biases and later disillusionment with Coleridge, which inflects this personal account. Hazlitt goes on to say, it might seem that the genius of his face is from a height surveyed and projected him into the world unknown of thought and imagination. Here the face is associated with the sphere of thought and imagination, connecting it to a transcendent reality. The genius of his face projected him. Language which seems to invest the face with action and agency. However, the world of thought and imagination is still unknown. And Hazlitt begins this sentence by saying, it might seem, again undermining the certainty of his own assertions. After this encounter, Hazlitt closes his reflections by saying, I had a light before me. It was the face of poetry. In this grand statement, Hazlitt forges a link between the particularity of Coleridge's individual face and the universality of poetry, highlighted by its capitalization. Despite the darkness and obscurity of the face, it still provides a light which can guide the young Hazlitt, suggesting the transformative power of the sublime face. In the same essay, Hazlitt also provides some brief remarks on Wordsworth's face. There was a severe worn pressure of thought about his temples, a fire in his eye, as if he saw something in objects more than the outward appearance an intense high narrow forehead, a Roman nose, cheeks furrowed by strong purpose and feeling, and a convulsive inclination to laughter about the mouth, a good deal of variance with the solemn stately expression of the rest of the, his face. Chantry's bust, which I have pictured here, uh, what he's referring to, uh, Chantry's bust wants the marking traits, but he was teased into making it regular and heavy. Hayden's head of him, so here we see a, a, a picture by a painting by Benjamin Robert Hayden, Christ's Entry into Jerusalem. Uh, and then you can see on the right side of the painting, there's a close up that I have there on the right of Wordsworth's face painted into it. Uh, so Hazlitt says, Hayden's head of him, introduced into the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem, is most like his drooping weight of thought and expression. In this description, Wordsworth's intellectual life is apparent in his face. The severe worn pressure of thought in his temples, the intensity of his forehead, and the strong purpose and feeling in his cheeks all posit the existence of something further beyond the mere physicality of his features, 
blurring the line between the external and internal domains. The fire in Wordsworth's eye also points to the dynamism of actual presence, which could not be encapsulated by a static representation, since the fire is emblematic of motion, life, and power. Wordsworth's ability to see something in objects more than outward appearance also ironically applies to Hazlitt here, who claims to see in Wordsworth's outward appearance much of his inner life. Interestingly, Hazlitt presents the face as contradictory. Wordsworth's expression is solemn, but this is at variance with his desire to laugh. Although the face contains particular parts, which may be at odds with one another, these parts somehow and mysteriously form a whole, which expresses the paradoxical unity of matter and spirit, the particular and the universal. This passage also exposes the inadequacy of artistic representations of the face. So Chantry and Hayden's portraits of Wordsworth are both from 1820, and neither are capable of replicating his presence. While Hayden succeeds more than Chantry, Hazlitt still says that this portrait is most like his drooping weight of thought and expression. The highest possible achievement of the portrait is to be like the authentic presence and inner life of the person, suggesting that a direct unmediated representation is beyond the bounds of artistic faculty. This portrait of Wordsworth represents him at 72 years of age. This work is from 1842, an oil painting, uh, also a painting by Benjamin Robert Hayden. Uh, so a prominent artist at the time, as well as a personal acquaintance of Wordsworth. Wordsworth is shown at three quarter length, gazing away from the viewer. Yet his downward gaze suggests that he is not looking at something external or concrete in the distance outside the frame of the painting, but rather that he is lost in thought fixated on ideas that can only be seen with the inward eye. In this way, the portrait makes visible the invisible, pointing to a realm beyond itself and its physicality. The background with its dramatic sky, rendered through abstract flashes of color, seems to idealize and emphasize the concreteness of the subject in its center. Wordsworth was satisfied with this portrait. He said that it was, quote, a likeness of me, not a mere matter of fact portrait, but one of a poetical character. In this evaluation of his portrait, mimesis is devalued. What really makes this portrait truthful is not that it captures exact physical th facts, but that it can capture something fleeting and transcendent, something similar to the artistry the poet must employ to authentically express their subject. I will linger on Wordsworth's face a moment longer to note how it is translated into words by Wordsworth admirer and fellow writer, Thomas De Quincey. In De Quincey's first in-person meeting with the poet he reveres, he describes Wordsworth's face in great detail. In his account of the meeting, De Quincey says, quote, that night, the first of my personal intercourse with Wordsworth, the first in which I saw him face to face was, it is little indeed to say, memorable. It was marked by a change even in the physical condition of my nervous system. Here we see the enduring impact of the face-to-face -face encounter, as well as the way in which it physically impacts De Quincey. The revealed face has a transformative effect on the self and cannot leave it untouched, as with any sublime experience. The face acts as an entry point into the person as a whole, making sense of what Ian Balfour identifies as De Quincey's peculiar and excessive fixation on Wordsworth's facial features. Quote, the passage coordinates the internal intellect passions with the external face body, such that everything is on one page with no possible discrepancy between inside and out. As well, the face stands in for something much larger than its mere material presence and inexplicably can represent multiple things. Quote, Wordsworth's face is at once regional, national, and poetic, aligned with the lower classes, yet having at the same time a kind of noble pedigree, end quote. Thus, the face not only reveals the whole person, transcending itself as a part of the body, but also transcends the person, shattering the boundaries of selfhood to embody other diverse persons and classes. In these visual and verbal portraits of Coleridge and Wordsworth, we can see not only the significance of facial representations to their time, but also the power of the face itself to pull the viewer outside of the self and provide a glimpse of transcendence, uniting self and other, but also reinforcing inevitable boundaries between them. 
Such examinations of the face's sublimity can help us to explore the, explore the nature of empathy, intimacy, and identity in the Romantic period. And to extend these considerations of the face's power to transform and reform to our own age and the faces we encounter on the canvas, on the screen, and in person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. And um, I move on to introduce our next presenter in literature and the other arts, um, Sean Thompson. Uh, Sean Thompson is a professor in the Literatures and Cultural Studies Department of the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. He's the author of The Romantic Architecture of Herman Melville's Moby Dick, The Fortress of American Solitude, Robinson Crusoe and Antebellum Culture, Division and Imagine Unity in the American Renaissance, The Seamless Whole, and numerous articles and reviews. His research interests include New York City history, technology, and popular culture. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Could you unmute yourself, Sean? You, you're still muted. Sean, can, can you unmute yourself? Okay. I'm just... Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, Again, this is a um, analysis of um, the House of Mirth and a novel that I've uncovered or trying to recover, uh, Garrett Van Horn by John S. Sazad. And I've worked with Sazad's other novel, his first novel, The Spite and Dival Chronicle, in my previous book. And now I'm moving towards this novel. And my intent is to kind of demonstrate the sort of the complexity of this novel by examining this tableau vivant scene and comparing it to um, House of Mirth. Okay. Um, the intent of this presentation is to examine the use of the tableau vivant in John S. Sazad's unknown 1863 novel, Garrett Van Horn, A Beggar on Horseback, and Edith Wharton's canonical 1905 novel, The House of Mirth. Translated from French, the tableau vivant means living pictures. The genre peaked in popularity between 1830 and 1920 during a performance of tableau vivant, a cast of characters represented scenes from literature, art, history, or everyday life on, st on a stage. As the curtain went up, the mob remained silent and frozen for roughly 30 seconds. The tableau vivants are for entertainment, and also enact scenes of power where symbols of national identity and empire are staged. Furthermore, tableau vivants convey a sexual power to the subject as a projection of beauty and as an object of value to be appreciated and appraised. In both novels, the tableau vivants represent an important turning point in the novel where the heroines put themselves in the spotlight. In the tableau vivant, Seen set in 1850 New York City, Lesbia home of Garrett Van Horn announces her coming out as a marriageable girl no longer under her father's control, while Lily Bart in The House of Mirth uses the tableau vivant at the end of the 19th century to show off her beauty and retain her status as still the most prized marriageable girl in New York high society. And I will spend most of my time uh, with Garrett Van Horn in the tableau scene. And I also want to talk about um, kind of the difficulty of figuring out which um, paintings are, are the subject or the, or the subject of the tableau vivant. Uh, in Garrett Van Horn, the tableau vivants take place within a masquerade ball, that, thus allowing a play of signs within signs that disrupts the boundary between what is a private self and what is a public persona. The masquerade ball hosted by the Holmes at the Maples is one of the set pieces of the novel Garrett Van Horn. 
Mr. Home uses the ball to reaffirm his Scottish pride and British patriotism in the American metropolis. The Maples is filled with his mostly English and Scottish friends and acquaintances, the clerks of his firm, Home, McLeod and Company, and an inner circle of New York high society. Garrett, the narrator of the novel, describes the Maples as resplendent in Mr. Home's Highland regalia. Yet Mr. Home's awkward display of the claymore his uncle wielded in the Battle of Karuna shows the impotency of these signs of power, position, and empire in modern day New York. The masquerade emphasizes Lesbia's self-fashioning of a feminine artifice as an assertion of her independence from her father's patriarchal control. Garrett describes Lesbia's choice of costume um, as asserting her freedom from her father's vision. Miss Home, contrary to her father's desire to have her appear as Flora McDonald and wear a huge uh, carnagorm brooch, was simply enrobed in a black domino. Flora McDonald represents a romantic heroine of Scotland recognized for her bravery in aiding the escape of Bonnie Prince Charles after the defeat of the Jacobites at the Battle of Culloden on April 16, 1746. She would be imprisoned in the Tower of London and would later marry a Scottish captain of the British army and immigrate to North Carolina where she took the side of the British loyalists. Her property was seized after the American independence and she resettled in Nova Scotia before returning to Scotland. Her life represents Scotland's tumultuous if not conflicted ties to Britannia as both a rebel of its monarchical rule and as an arm of its empire. Lesbia creates her own costume to break free of Scottish identity forced upon her by her father. She is a cosmopolitan born in, in Spain, educated in London, growing up in New York City with her ambition of launching a singing career in Paris. Garrett's emphasis on Lesbia's black dress and simple garb contrasts with the retinue of costumes hero, costumed heroes such as Captain McKeith, masquerade standbys of pal pal palladians, paladins, bandits, and, um, and I'm gonna be terrible with these French words, debardeurs or harlequins and idyllic romantic figures of the 18th century. The masquerade ball serves as a staging or a play of signs and symbols that hold in their artifice a persona. And this is a quote from the, the novel. Sandy Fraser, a red-haired gentleman, created much merriment as Bail Nakor Jarvie, and a tall lady in spectacles was very imposing as a Watayan shepherdess. Eugene Kemptop, Mr. Kemptop's third son, came as a bandit, and his sister Olivia as the bandit's bride. Most notable and resplendent of all, however, was now, I don't know quite how to pronounce Norma Hall. It's spelled N-O-U-R-M-A-H-A-L. Gorgeous in pearl and gold. This was Miss Cora Goldestone, sister to Gavin Sport Goldestone, the consumptive crusader. Another paladin, uh, a tall, robust fellow with bristling whiskers and a very uneasy in his armor of proof and his starched Byron collar was Minert Van Horn, whose brother, the Marquis in maroon velvet, having evidently made up his mind to be misanthropic that evening, stood apart with folded arms watching the black domino and our group of danglers with a jaundiced eye. The masquerade is a vehicle for establishing an elite social order in this self-fashioned space of courtship. These characters pro promote an aspect of self from their masquerade that is not readily apparent or non-existing in their real selves. Sandy Fraser's appearance in Mr. Holmes' country house as Jarvie pays homage to this Highland culture and elevates Mr. Holmes' hospitality and power that reconstitutes Rob Roy, who uses his social position to subdue his unruly band, this unruly band of fighting Scots, who are in reality his own business partners and employees. The tall bookish lady no doubt benefits from the plungy neckline of an idyllic Watayan rustic and Miss Cora Goldestone makes herself beguiling as the exotic light of the harem from Thomas More's poem. 
Uh, Dr. Rose Lothario in monk dress does well to conceal his licentious desires. Minert's costume and his likeness of the dashing rake Byron is an attempt to imbue, imbue his own character with something Lesbia has stated he noticeably lacks, sex appeal. Unlike the other masquerade goers who put on a persona, Lesbia draws attention to her own dark mystery. Garrett speaks of Lesbia as, in, as intensifying her allure. The refined coquette hiding so many charms in an ugly silk cloak who could mistake her? For what other maiden could match that chin and throat whose tint was the more dazzling in contrast with the bl black velvet loo? Garrett observes Lesbia as the centerpiece of the ball, the black velvet half mask and the silk cloak of her masquerade intensifies her crimson color while the simplicity of her dress enhances her pose. Um, Garrett views her as a coquette in her ability to direct and misdirect the attention of the men playing one suitor against another. Garrett's frustration of being pushed to the margins and not receiving Lesbia's attention informs his narrative distance to the ball. Garrett views himself in the third person detached from the gaiety as he stood apart with folded arms watching the black domino and a group of danglers with a jaundiced eye. The tableau nest, nest within the masquerade is a vehicle for the bells of New York high society to present themselves in their best light to, to, to potential gentlemen suitors. Mr. Holm has staged these pictures to promote his own prejudices and nationalism. Yet the tableau vivant open up a performative space where the women can play in the charged signs and symbols of empire. And here's a, a quote about the, um, that describes the tableau. The guests were now amusing themselves with, the, with tableau. One end of the spacious drawing room had been curtailed off for the display and Dr. Rose acted as stage manager. There is a scene from the Arabian Nights with a fat gentleman as a bearded Pasha sitting cross-legged, smoking a nargil and fanned by Miss Goldstone, the Norma Hall. The next was Miss Scott as the white lady of Avenal, after which came the confessional with, with Laura as the fair penitent and Dr. Rose as the priest and lastly, as the bouquet, the curtain rose on a beautiful picture entitled The Dying Gorilla. This was very pretty and effective. On a couch lay the wooden man, his escopeta falling from his feeble grasp while a girl put a cup to his lip and a friar standing by upheld a crucifix. True, the soldier, instead of being a stalwart man was personated by Goldstone, the small, but the friar was good and nothing could possibly for it was Lesbia home. In trim blue kirtle and close fitting basquina. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, in white silk, stockings and tiny black satin slippers and attire which audaciously permitted the display of much superb roundness of limb, how they all stared at this new phase of Miss Holmes' beauty. The gentlemen for their part were so well pleased with this tableau, tableau that they could have stayed and admired it till morning. Um, the first tableau presents a picture of the Arabian Nights with Miss Goldstone, the normal hall. And I don't know how to pronounce that word. Uh, if this scene comes from the 1839-8041 publication of the, United, of the Thousand and One Nights, translated by ethnographer Edwin William Lane with the illustrations by acclaimed British engraver, William Harvey, it leaves behind Lane's historical accuracy of Arab, of Arabia and Egyptian and Moorish architecture for a mishmash of cultural references. This pantomime in its lack of specificity reflects an Orientalism in the blurring of East Asia, India, and the Middle East, Arabia. Miss Goldstone's dress in the guise of normal hall 
is a reference to Thomas More's poem, Norma Hall, Light of the Harem, and her beloved Celine from the immensely popular, popular tale of Lala Rook. Norma Hall first appeared in Dryden's restoration verse, tragedy, Arun Zeberg as the Empress of Hindustans. More's oriental romance tale of Lala Rook is a much more sensual affair that reflects a female Byronic sense and sensibility. More sent the poem in the Orient on the advice of Lord Byron. The poem tells the story of Mughal King Argu's daughter setting off on her wedding voyage from Delhi to Kashmir, accompanied by the poet Firmazors. And Root, the poet, narrates the prince's four long stories that make the princess fall in love with him. The tale of La La Rook inspired British adventurers to travel to the, to the Kashmir that Moore described as a paradise on earth, even though he had never been there himself. Mr. Holmes' evocation of India through this tableau vivant asserts the power of the East India Company that Mr. Holmes, as the operating um, an arm of the financial firm Home, McLeod and Co. in New York City would certainly be heavily invested in. He is asserting his and East India Company and the subsequent British Ross claim upon India through Miss Goldstone's portrayal of the light of harem in Indian dress fanning the seated round rotund pasha. The power of Moore's tale Lala Rook so infiltrated the Western imagination that the Taj Mahal was referred to as the tomb of Norma Hall. And here's a picture of um, Norma Hall. Um, and you can see that it takes place in a harem and um, Norma Hall is trying to kind of regain the Sultan's attention. And so she sings to him um, disguised. And after she sings, then he elevates her um, in the harem. Um, but we can also see, um, this is from a London News Illustrated, that, that there are certain places that are referred to as the Norma Hall's tomb. So you have this ways in which there's this fantasy of, of the Orient or of, of India becomes put into reality, right? India sort of takes possession of these, of these places and gives it the name of this um, tomb of Norma Hall. Um, the picture also gestures toward an eroticism um, of the Middle East and the exoticism of India. Mrs. Goldstone's tableau is also a problematic dumb show of Eugene Delacroix's oriental pictures of harems, such as the women of Algiers. Um, um, or the exotic romanticism of uh, Jean Auguste Dominique Ingres. These paintings allowed Western men to channel their sexual fantasies into these guarded inner sanctums of the super sensuous room. Um, Cora Gold, Goldstone chose the normal whole costume to show herself in a new light to her potential suitors. Moore's poem dramatizes Norma Hall's reconciliation with her estranged sultan um, after she sings before him and is elevated from the light of the harem to the light of the world. Miss Goldstone hopes to embody the latter rather than the former and be recognized as Moore's, Moore's uh, rights, the loveliest, dearest of them all, the one whose smile shone out alone amidst a world, the only one. She channels the play of the masquerade to step out of high society formality and inhabits this fantasy of the super sensual orient. I think it could be said that Cora's persona is a bold choice for despite the call of women to abide by social restraint and be ever vigilant in protecting the reputation, Cora Goldstone acts out her readerly fantasy life and exposes it to view. Though Garrett's rather mundane description of Miss Goldstone as Norma Hall does little to excite what the 19th century phrenologists had identified as the outsized amativeness organ, we as readers should recognize Cora Goldstone's tableau as a female adventure story in the making as she navigates social customs and manners 
as a female reader full of desire and a longing to be loved. Um, Miss Scott's tableau is taken from Sir Walter Scott's The Monastery. Um, uh, um, the monastery of his Waverly novel, Scott depicts a divided Scotland between a Catholic faction which favors the old alliance with France and an emerging Protestant grouping which desires closer links with England. In the novel, Mary Avenol and Halbert Glendinning have deep ties to the Abbey of Kennequerher, but the white lady, the supernatural guardian spirit of the destiny of the House of Avenal causes Mary to relinquish her ties to Catholicism and convert to Protestantism. Her marriage to Halibert, who has also conveyed and enters the service of the Earl of Murray, half-brother to Mary, Queen of Scots, symbolizes Scotland's union with England in the Reformation. In staging this tableau, Miss Scott puts her whiteness front and center. The White Lady of Avenal and Miss Scott in white dress sets up the syllogism. If whiteness is Protestantism and Protestantism is Britishness, then whiteness is Britishness. Um, Laura Ludlow's depiction of the Scottish painter, um, David Wilkie's confessional, is a painting of a young woman um, with her back to the viewer in a semi-open confessional box. As she leans into the stern priest to confess her sins, a crowd of onlookers look upon her kneeling figure and exposed ankles and bare feet. Through this, through the picture, uh, through the picturesque and old, and old master color and energy of the confessional, Wilkie celebrates an ordinary moment from everyday life. Wilkie painted these genre paintings of Catholicism to celebrate the life of the peasants of Spain showing Catholicism in a good light in contrast to the godless rationalism of France that emerged from the French Revolution. Yet in 1850s New York, the liturgics and rituals of the Catholic Church became ridiculed and sensationalized. Through the, through the confessional tableau, Mr. Home is both elevating this great Scottish painter and the superiority, superiority of Mr. Home's own Scottish Protestantism. In the in the 1848 publication, The Wilkie Gallery, a selection of the best pictures of the late Sir David Wilkie, the author George Virtue uh, comments on Wilkie's depiction of a confessional. The confessional, what a host of almost fearful uh, associations arise as we think of this discipline of the Catholic Church, terrible alike to the frail being whose every lawless thought must be, bar must be bared to inspection and to the no less frail depository of the darkest secrets of the human heart. Laura Ludlow entertains the idea of joining the convent, but in coming to New York, she has fallen for an Astor Opera House performer and taking an interest in the theatrical arts, even practicing her stage falls in the house. Laura and Dr. Rose mine the tableau scene for its salaciousness and melodrama. Laura has seized upon the detail of the bare ankles to suggest the fair penitent's vulnerability in confessing her dark secrets to the leering priest. Laura Ludlow appropriates this scene to make herself a fascinating object for the men to imagine what those sins might be and the dangers of the peasant girl's intimacy with her confessor. Uh, the final tableau featuring Lesbia in the dying gorilla is an amalgamation of Kate Charles Knight's poem, Dying Gorilla, and Sir David Wilkie's poem, painting, The Gorilla's Return. Mr. Holm exploits these depictions of the Spanish gorillas in the Peninsula Wars to fold Lesbia's Spanish heritage within the British Empire. After her Spanish mother's death, Mr. Holm established Lesbia within his, this noble Protestant marshmallow family lineage. Mr. Holmes spiriting his daughter to the chaplain of HBM's frigate consternation to be christened after ancestress Lady Lesbia Mar uh, Marshmallow and her mother's family's efforts to re-Christian Le Lesbia according to the rituals of the Roman Catholic Church reveals Lesbia's contested identity. 
fearing his wife and her family will pull her into the charms and superstitions of Catholicism, Mr. Holm believes that Lesbia's salvation was only attainable with certainty through the Church of England and its 39 articles. In sending Lesbia to London, Mr. Holm seeks to sever her connection to her Spanish family, make her into a lady, and elevate her in society as a member of the British nobility. The dying gorilla represents the supremacy of the British Empire on land and by sea. Charles Knight published uh, Dying Gorilla in the Windsor Express, August 22nd, 1812, as a celebration of the British victory and the dawn of a new era of the British Empire. He writes of the impetus for writing his Dying Gorilla. Quote, my dying gorilla was not a false prophet when he exclaimed, I see embattled Europe's wrath sublime, rush to the field and blackness all the climb, insulted nations spurn their blood-stained lord, and vengeance draw the soul redeeming sword. Charles Knight further states in this passage of working life during a half century, how his news of the victory of Salamanca led to a fur, fur, fur and an outpouring of patriotism. Quote, I was meditating upon the unofficial news which had arrived on the Saturday night of a victory in Spain, shaping my thoughts into exulting verse as the death song of a gorilla who lay bleeding on the battlefield. Suddenly, from the not so distant barracks rose the burst of God save the king and the cheers of a multitude that England might shout for a mighty victory by land as she had shouted for the Nile and for Trafalgar. Um, Mr. Holm uses the tableau to stage Lesbia's Spanish identity in the service of the British victory of Salamanca. Lesbia's dark features that made her an unconvincing lady, Lamora, uh, compels Mr. Holm to couple her Spanish blood with the British Empire and bring to life Sir Wilkie's uh, the, gorilla's the Gorilla's Return that depicts the return of a wounded Spanish gorilla. Um, his distressed wife greets the depleted gorilla with his arms and a sling, while a kneeling woman with a bowl of water prepares to bathe his wounds. The tableau and Wilkie's painting capture the moment when the gun the gorilla held falls from his grasp. Uh, quote, on, on a couch lay the wounded man, his escopeta falling from his feeble grasp, while a girl put a cup to his lips and a friar standing by upheld a crucifix. Unquote. Mr. Holmes substitutes the donkey, the gorilla rides into the village for a couch and combines the wife and attendant in Lesbia's act of giving the fallen gorilla a drink. In addition, in the painting, the priest supports the gorilla on his donkey while the confessor in the tableau signified by the crucifix readies to give the gorilla his last rites. Garrett aestheticized this tableau and remarks that Goldstone rather diminutive frame does not raised the tableau to its heroic grandeur of the dying gorilla. In Wilkie's painting, the wife is the only figure who is animated and fully lighted, carrying the emotional um, of the scene. She stands in three quarters profile in a blue dress. Her hands are upraised to express her worry as her eyes look up at the depleted gorilla on a donkey. But Garrett recognizes its effective elements namely the friar and the prepossessing lesbia who steals the scene. The tableau valorizes the Spanish peasants and common soldiers who resisted military order and professionalization to fight the French in the Iberian Peninsula War. And this is sort of the first way, first time sort of gorilla is used in this way. Um, um, Wilkie's romanticization of the gorilla's sacrifice in aid of Wellington's defeat of the French serves to affirm the power and reach of the British Empire. Garrett knows this pony, painting and he conveys his thrill in seeing the painting come to life. Nothing could possibly be more beautiful than the well-dressed and too high-bred looking Spanish peasant girl for it was Lesbia Home in, tr in trim blue kirtle and close-fitting basquina. In discerning Lesbia as well-dressed and too high-bred looking in Spanish peasant girl, Garrett highlights the artifice of the tableau as not conveying the dirt and grime of Wilkie's salt of the earth genre painting, but as a likeness of the Spanish peasant girl's dark, dark eyes and black hair and crimson coloring and fair complexion, Lesbia is a dead ringer. 
As Garrett is taken by Lesbia's dark beauty brought to the fore by the tableau, we are participants of this scene and can glimpse Lesbia in the flesh and blood some 150 years from literary obscurity in Happity Wilkie's The Gorilla's Return. Fast forward to another portrayal of the tableau in The House of Mirth, written about 40 years after Garrett Van Horn. Edith Wharton describes the dozens fashionable, the dozen fashionable women who have been induced to participate in a tableau vivant, posing themselves after the painting of such old masters as Titian and Van Dyck. While Mr. Van Horn, um, well, Mr. Uh, Holmes' tableau is a less opulent and sumptuous affair. This sexual display is also seen in Lily Bart's appearance in the tableau as eliciting the unanimous O oh! of the spectators was a tribute not to, of the, to the brushwork of Reynolds, Miss Lloyd, but to the flesh and blood loveliness of Lily Bart. She had purposely chosen a picture without distracting accessories address or surroundings. Her pale draperies and the background of foliage against which she stood serves only to relieve the long dryad-like curves that swept upward from her poised foot to her lifted arm. As Lily approaches the age of 30 when she would no longer be a marriageable girl, Lily uses the tableau to cement her place as the most beautiful in high society. The effect of Lily's appearance as Reynolds' Miss Lloyd is reflected in the contrasting views of Lawrence Selden Gus Trenner and Rosedale. Selden sees her as capturing the spirit of the painting, the true realization of Reynolds' ideal of beauty. He speaks of seeing her as the real Lily Bart, apart from the artifice and wealth of her social world. In contrast, the, her image in this revealing, um, I'm sorry, uh, in contrast, her image in this revealing outfit lays bare her physical form, seeing Lily in the tableau, stirs Gus Tenner's sex drive, and he acts upon his animalistic urges to lure Lily to his empty home. Gus Trenner believes that in giving Lily money, which he veils as her stock dividends, he is entitled to possess her as his mistress. Rosedale sees Lily as the trophy that he can buy. Registering the stir created by the unveiling of Lily's tableau, Rosedale later offers Lily a transactional marriage proposals in which she will use her charms, refinements, and graces as a hostess to temper his vulgarity and elevate him in high society. Rosedale's wealth will support her love of jewelry, fashion, and decor, and shield her reputation from the scandalous gossip concerning her affairs with Lawrence and Gus. Lesbia, like Lily, uses that tableau as a display of her charms and beauty. Monica, Monica Ebert showed how the growing middle class of women used tableau vivants to alter their personal identities, trying on new costumes and characters as a way to merge their public and private self and exploring new phases of their identity. Garrett recognized her description of her dress, ire which audaciously permitted the display of much suburb roundness of limb, how they all stared at this new phase of Miss Holmes' beauty. The gentlemen for their part were so well pleased with this tableau that they could have stayed admiring it till morning. This new phase of Miss Holmes' beauty is the declaration of her becoming a marriageable girl and an awakening of her sexual power and her reception to the male gaze. Um, in Garrett's conversation with Dr. Rose after a dinner hosted by Mr. Holm at the Maples to honor the renowned British naturalist, Mr. Ash Burnham, Dr. Rose expresses his view of Lesbian's costume at the masquerade in a short petticoats as an advertisement of her beauty. Dr. Rose sees Lesbia as aware of her sexual power and uses the masquerade and tableau to show off her this shapely calf just where the Gastrocinemius joins the soleus. Were you an anatomist, you'd appreciate those beauties better. Lord, what would Flaxman not have given for such a model? Begad, I don't wonder at her fancy masquerades and short petticoats. She's excusable, certainly possessing such charms to which to display as much of them as possible. As a doctor, 
Dr. Rose views the body, society, art, and artifice as all stripped of their refinements. It's this base, the basement of high culture to the level of mass entertainment is shown in his reference to the neoclassical artist John Flaxman's use of drapery to reveal the human figure. Flaxman was well known in the 19th century for his illustrations of Homer and Dante, his monumental sculpture, and his Wedgwood bust reliefs. In a lecture given to the British Royal Academy, he states of drapery as a medium through which the human figure is intelligible, may, may be compared with speech by which ideas and thoughts are perceived. Dr. Rose alludes to Flaxman's very popular Wedgwood bust relief, The Dancing Hours, that depicted the female form in tight, clinging drapery in various poses from the front, back, and three-quarter profile. His belief that the sexual drive is natural is seen in the 19th century view of imaginativeness as the largest center of, or, or organ in the brain. Dr. Rose is voicing his fondness for the female figure and his interest in, in art that does not obscure or hide the form, but it exposes it. Hiram Powers, the Greek slave, would, um, would materialize this view of an art that leaves little to the imagination. During his 1847 to 1851 tour of the Eastern United States, aware that the slave's nudity would be seen as obscene, Powers was carefully to pronounce the sculpture's high moral and intellectual beauty. Um, Dr. Rose is a philosophical materialist who views beauty not as an idealist form, but as, as an anatomist who apprises the form and function of the meeting of the gastrocemius and the soleus. He sees what is to be seen and knows Lesbi has chosen her short petticoats to display as much of them as possible. Dr. Rose is an embodiment of David Reynolds' characterization of the new era as releasing the power of the sex drive. It is this context that the tableau vivant staged in Mr. Holmes' parlor as drawn from the voyeuristic shows of model artists that became popular during the 1840s. Reynolds writes that in these shows, lightly draped women gave the illusion of nudity when they posed as classical deities of legendary women ranging from even at Eve in Eden through Venus in a shell to Lady Godiva. The first of these shows was given at Palmero's Opera House in New York and was soon imitated to taverns nationwide at every price, ranging from sixpence to a dollar. Though there's no evidence that Edith Wharton's House of Mirth Tableau vivant scene was influenced by Cezanne's Garrett von Horn. The novel was not cataloged in her library at the Wharton House, though the library, that library is incomplete. It is easy to see the similarities. Garrett van Horn is like Lawrence Selden, an aesthetic admirer of the shining star of the tableau of vivants. And Dr. Rose, like Gus Trenner, is aroused by the display of the female form before him. Likewise, Lily and Lesbia take control of their image and use it to project qualities of themselves in the best light. Lily advertises her by high value as the most alluring, marriageable girl on the market, and Lesby announces her entrance onto the stage of the courtship as a marriageable girl of 16 or 17. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Um, uh, um, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, and thank you again, Jenny, for, for those uh, two marvelous presentations. And let me um, then open the floor uh, to our audience for questions. And please just uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. I, I am hearing, uh, I'm seeing um, a notification here in my screen that my uh, internet connection is unstable, but can you hear me well? Jenny, I, I find fascinating the way in which, you, in which you're able to, to trace and describe that way in which the portrait uh, is that liminal space that joins the visible and the invisible. And also the way in which you describe that dynamic by which it would almost seem like, um, like 
portraiture and that is the, the visual art of portraiture and the literary art of portraiture seem to almost entice one another to go to greater levels, mm -hmm. both of detail and of um, reference to that uh, sublime, ineffable sort of uh, dimension that seems to mark somehow their success. Like it seems, it would seem like the greater success is to more clearly express that ineffable. Um, so my first question for you is, is if you see, um, if you see one form of expression or, or the other sort of reaching, reaching um, more into, into, that, um, into that sort of level of ineffability, or if there is some reference, um, so, so, some reference uh, to, to the failure of one, um, of one medium to, to convey that uh, more than the other in your descriptions uh, of, of portraits of, of artists? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, I kind of see them as working in conjunction with each other to and, and like looking that at them alongside each other, these two forms to see how they're both inadequate in certain senses. And the way they do kind of use one another. So in the passage that I talked about from Hazlitt, how he was trying to describe uh, Coleridge's face using words, but how he was making reference to uh, portrait painters and to a particular style of faces to be able to describe what these faces looked like. So it's kind of like he needed to create this pastiche of description um, that he wants his his readers to understand it. He wants his readers to uh, be thinking about a, a particular portrait, to, have, to be visualizing something in mind. Um, and so something I'm like, really interested in looking at is the way that uh, portraits, like actual visual portraits are described in literary works. Uh, and so kind of seeing this sense of how the portrait is being described um, in novels where it's included or that sort of thing, the portrait's being described and rendered into words. Uh, so it's another layer of mediation or removed from the initial face-to-face -face encounter. Um, so both of those, like whether it's a, a visual portrait or a verbal portrait, in a sense, they're both drawing attention to the fact that these are uh, detached from the actual face-to-face -face encounter, um, that both of them were uh, kind of inspired by in this sense of like Hazlitt's encounter, for example, with Coleridge uh, was an actual face-to-face -face encounter that's now at a remove. And then um, the portrait, the visual portrait being grounded in an actual face-to-face -face encounter between the artist and subject. Uh, but the sense that in both in both um, forms, something of the artist or author is um, kind of filtering into the actual subject. So the subject is also mediated through the lens uh, and something of the subjectivity of the creator. Uh, so there's kind of like these these levels where they both point to um, the others the others uh, obscurity or um, inadequacy to to fully represent fully represent the self in the way that there's a reference, especially in um, in literature to um, like being laid out like a visual scene. So kind of a, a blending between the two. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question at all. It does, it does so well, thank you. I just unmuted myself. Um, thank you for your presentations. Um, very interesting. Um, I have a question for Jenny. For these two questions, um, I wonder how, how far uh, are you going to go into the nineteenth century with these relations between visual and textual portraits? I, I just thought the, the oval portrait, but mm -hmm. Paul, and I wonder if you're going to include, you know, authors like him. That's one question, and well, I'll let you answer that one, and then the other. Right. Uh, yeah, I think 
in working on a project like this, I think the hardest thing I find is to kind of narrow it down because uh, I find, you know, examples of this sort of thing do abound um, in literature of this period and portraits. So I really had to keep kind of confining myself. Uh, really, kind of my focus is on focusing on like a few particular authors. So I've, I've been really interested in looking at Mary Hayes and the memoirs of Emma Courtney and her kind of verbal, her rendering of a, a portrait within the novel. Uh, that kind of sparks the protagonist's love. And then um, another author of focus, I'm really interested in Thomas De Quincey and the way the face holds like a, a power, a sense of like, terror in um, in his confession. So um, my, yeah, my kind of scope of the project is more like the from the late 18th century to the early 19th century. Okay, great. That answers, that answers my second question. So. No need to ask it, but okay. <laughs> I'll ask it anyway. No, because I was thinking about photography and the birth of photography, mm -hmm. um, which is a bit later than your period, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that mm -hmm. introduces a whole new regime of representations and access to portraits, mm -hmm. etc. But absolutely, then, yeah. No, that's it's really interesting because I've. I've been doing some research about just printing printing technologies of the time and the way that um, a lot of printmakers, there's kind of, you know, debate over whether they should be considered artists of the same caliber uh, of uh, portraitists or uh, painters and that sort of thing. And the sense of like whether, what is the purpose of a portrait or artistry? It's, you know, is it making something that's representing the inner spirit of the person? And if something is just seen as copying or just um, going for like physical for mimesis, then can it be considered a work of art in the same sense? These kind of uh, debates, I think, uh, with printing technologies then go into photography. And, and of course, like I think there's a lot of relevance to these kind of issues even now um, with uh, like different representations of the face that we see through the screen or uh, that sort of thing. And, and now the way that we are seeing a lot of faces mediated to us through um, the mask and seeing only part of a face at a time. So yeah, I think that'd be really interesting to consider with photography as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's also a really interesting thing to have someone describing their experience of a painting or a portrait and we see, we don't see that much in American literature up until James and Wharton. Um, and it's really something that when we see, read it, it's really sort of fascinating to see how they're reading and, and appreciating a painting or a portrait. And it's interesting how you were talking about how even the, the people themselves are talking about their likeness to their own portrait or their own image. Are they, do they have a sense of their sense of their immortality, like this is their, like no one would really care about their painting of them, their portraiture, unless they thought this was going to represent them for, you know, generations to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because there it was a tradition of uh, posthumous portraiture as well, where there would be uh, like a family or group portrait sometimes where, um, like a, a just a recently deceased family member or something would be sometimes shown as part of the family or sometimes shown as kind of like up above and in a corner or something, almost like a, an apotheosis of that family member or something. Um, so there is this sense with, with that as well as this like portraiture being this kind of bridge perhaps between um, something mortal and something immortal. And um, and I definitely think that's uh, like we can see with a lot of portrait subjects who you know, want to really be able to control their image and the way they're being represented. And like uh, portrait subjects who would have the artist update the portrait because the, the fashions would change or like the hairstyle would change or something. Or, like you need to, you need to alter the portrait a little bit so that it reflects uh, whatever is, is most trendy at this time. So wanting to kind of keep up with the time so the portrait can be the most favorable testament to them um, once they're no longer there. I, I am thinking, um, especially now, Jenny, as I, as I hear this answer of the so solemn character that sometimes portraiture can have precisely because of that 
relation to death and to, to temporality. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking of a moment, Sean, when you were describing how this tableau vivant is, is represented in, in the novel. Um, and it seems like there is, uh, I think it's a donkey that is substituted by a couch. Um, and so I wanted to ask you both on the, the dimension of humor, if you have found, um, if you have found an interest in, in humor, perhaps in seeing how sometimes there's a failure to reach a certain level, perhaps set by either the real face-to-face -face or, or, the, or the image itself that is, that is being represented through the Tableau Vivant. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Now, now um, in the Lily Bart, she is this painting by Reynolds. I mean, she is almost, she's sort of the, brings it to life, brings the beauty to life. So she is like the living figure of the painting. But I think you're right in the, in the tableaus that um, in the Garrett Van Horn, he's, there is this disconnect between what they're supposed to represent and what they actually actually represent, and they're they're much much lower key, like much more humble attempts to to create these tableaus. But what emerges from it is that picture of Lesbia, and that, and I think that's so remarkable that we can look at that painting by Wilkie, and we can see exactly what Garrett Van Horn is seeing of her. I mean, that is her even though she doesn't have the, the grime of the, the, the peasant, Spanish peasant woman, but that's her and her dark, complex, dark um, eyes and, and dark hair and her color. So, so there is this, I think Garrett Van Horn and Sazad is playing with this disconnect, this comedy between the, 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 the tableau and the reality or the, you know, the fantasy and the reality. Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting point when you bring up about or a question about humor as well and like kind of the somber nature of a lot of portraits um, and kind of going back to mortality again, a lot of uh, portraits are, you know, represented with a skull or something like that representing mortality. Um, and I think there's something that just makes me think of, I've been doing some research lately on um, portraits in Austin's novels and in Pride and Prejudice, the, the scene where uh, Elizabeth is, uh, sees the uh, the gallery at Pemberley of all these portraits and she sees the portrait of Mr. Darcy and this is kind of like this pivotal moment for her to to uh, forge a new create a new impression of Darcy that's more favorable by seeing his portrait and it doesn't give that much detail about the portrait but it describes that him as smiling which is kind of an unusual detail because you're right like we don't see that as much in in a lot of portraits and um that the sense of the like, Kim smiling might have been showing us uh, a window into what the actual uh, the actual um, moment of encounter at the time of painting the portrait was that uh, it was becoming common sometimes for uh, the subject of a portrait when it was being painted to have maybe some family members or friends there. So we might be seeing a glimpse into the subject's personality or uh, an encounter, a face-to-face -face encounter between them and someone that they know or care about. So this sense of that um, in, in many ways, maybe portraits are starting to represent more of the inner life and even relationships of the other person. So maybe a sense of, of humor and more, um, and more personality in that way than earlier portraits that were perhaps more focused on symbols of status or accessories and more on the background rather than the face, uh, the artist trying to make the face show expression or show a hint of an inner life. Yeah, and that, uh, there's, there's a really interesting thing that happened when I was talking about Cora Gold, Goldstone as the normal hall, or I don't, I don't even know how to pronounce that word. But I couldn't find I couldn't find what that was a reference to. All I could find was a reference to the Dryden um, play. But that that knowing that it came from this you know Byronic you know influenced poem and it was immensely popular at the time that opened up so many kind of uh, opened up a new dimension by which to understand why Cora chose that that 
costume and what she was performing by wearing that costume. Um, because before I didn't know, I didn't have any sense of what it meant. And, and it also shows that this was an immensely popular poem in its time, but yet it was very difficult to find any reference to it. It's sort of a forgotten work. Sean, that, that, that reminded me of a moment that I found uh, particularly striking. And it is the construction, not only of, of this vision of exoticism and orientalism and, and this imagined India um, with all the, its connotations of sexuality and, and sensuality and so on, um, but also the construction of whiteness through the skin itself of, of the marble statues. And I wonder if, if, that, um, if that view of, or, or, or if that understanding of a construction of whiteness that somehow goes to, to, to statues and, and to marble is something that, um, that, you, that you have looked more into or that has more relevance in other fields of research or areas of, uh, of academia today? Well, I, I, I kind of, I mean, I kind of picked up on the sort of the white lady, just the, the way that this white lady functions in the Waverly novels to move from Catholicism to Protestantism and, and how that whiteness is a stand in for, you know, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And so I, I saw this as, and, and I don't, and it's interesting to under, try to understand like who is signaling this? Is this what Sazad, the author is signaling? And is he criticizing or parodying or satirizing this view of whiteness? Or is this what was actually performed in, you know, in these tableaus at the time? So I, I and, and it's sort of, I don't know where Sazad stands in relation to this performance of whiteness or the white lady. And it's also a reference to how um, oftentimes the tableaus would perform sort of religious um, scenes or, or moments or, or religious um, events. So there is a religious element to the tableaus as well. Um, often in America, they would you know, they would portray like the Puritans landing or they portray, um, you know, religious scenes or they were portray sort of Columbia, sort of these patriotic scenes. So I, I'm, I think I was saying sort of it's all caught up in the tableau, but, it, but this tableau is being performed by a Scottish nobleman. And so it reflects his Scottishness. Certainly, and that dimension too of, of a Protestantism versus Catholicism, I think is interesting too. Jenny, if I may, just one last question. Um, I found so, um, so interesting the description of the artist's power through their faces. And I was, I, I just couldn't help but thinking um, if, if you have found any examples of, uh, of female, of, of descriptions of, of a female artists. Um, and if, because I think it would be interesting to contrast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would definitely be interesting to kind of look at in comparison. Um, kind of lens that I've been looking uh, at this through recently is looking at how uh, female characters in literature are able to, in a sense, be an artist or a creator of faces through reading faces. Um, so seeing this as like an avenue that's open uh, to women that through their um, through their reading of faces or their controlling of faces that they're able to exert agency and to express desire through that. So um, like I was mentioning with Mary Hayes's novel in that novel, Emma Courtney is, um, she is able to read into this portrait um, the uh, her and express her own desire through that reading of the portrait. So the kind of portraitive version uh, of Augustus of the subject takes precedence over the actual uh, original person. So in a sense, she becomes 
through uh, as a reader and viewer of the portrait, she becomes, uh, in a sense, a creator of it. Um, so these are, you know, rather than um, kind of talking about like actual characters doing that, female characters, um, rather than um, female portraitists, but um, also in kind of looking at uh, female characters and the protagonist in Austin's novels, I've been considering a similar thing where um, like Elizabeth and Pride and Prejudice and Catherine Moreland and Northanger Abbey that they're able to create their own imaginative visions of the portraits they encounter. Uh, and then in Emma, uh, Emma is able to actually create portraits and try to control the situation. Uh, it, it's not successful, but this is an avenue for her to exert agency is through representing the face and actually altering the face so that it doesn't it doesn't represent the subject Harriet in as accurate a light as possible. She's actually kind of adding or manipulating the face to be able to control the outcome through this portrait she she presents. So I think those are kind of interesting examples to look at female characters and how they interact with faces or portraits is perhaps a means for expressing agency or desire that sometimes in situations where uh, that outlet wouldn't be otherwise available to them. And, and I, I find so so compelling the way in which you in which you see that um, as a, as an act of creation that that one of interpretation and and uh, mm -hmm. I think that's that's indeed very very good. Oh, thank you. Um, well, if there are no other questions, uh, it's just uh, a. I just I just have to thank you one more time. It's been great to to hear you and to see you tonight. Uh, be well and see you next time. Yes, Jenny, and that was a wonderful paper. That was that is just that's just great. And oh, I hope you, you can expand on it and move it in different directions. Oh, have you, you thought about much. bringing in William Turner? Have, have you has he coming in at all? I would I would love to I haven't yeah I haven't thought about it so much yet um just because I've kind of yeah I, I kind of keep feeling like I need to continually narrow and narrow and um cut things out but I really would like to to look at Turner because I love Turner's painting and yeah, I didn't mean so to cut us short oh no <laughs> I really enjoyed your paper as well yeah, I'm interested to look more into Tableau Vivant. Like it's not something that I really have um, looked into too much, but it kind of makes me think about hmm, how I could, I wonder if that would uh, uh, factor into my own project at all. It's really interesting. Well, great. Thank you, Pilar. That was great. Yep. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye. Bye.